I'm excited I'm here to introduce our speaker tonight. And really, uh, if you were here last meeting, you heard me gush about her, and I'm going to gush about her for a few more minutes here before she starts. Um, it really is my pleasure to introduce her tonight. Um, I've known her personally for 15 years, uh, and during that time she's been a professor of mine, um, she's been an advisor, and she's been a mentor to me. Uh, professionally, uh, Diane Gasky has been a pioneer in new media for learning, having written the first book on interactive media publishing uh, in 1985. She's on the faculty at Ithaca College. Um, she's been there for 30 years um, and has just recently been promoted to be dean of the Roy H. Park School of Communications at that college. Aside from her academic work, uh, she also owns her own uh, performance consulting uh, company called Gaiaski Analytics. So she has she practices what she preaches. Uh, and, and as far as ISPI goes, she, uh, in 2008, she was awarded the uh, Thomas Gilbert um, the uh, ISPI Distinguished Professional Achievement Award. Um, and, and she is, you guys are in for a treat. I don't want to take any more of her time. I can talk about it all night. Um, so with that, Diane, it's on you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to try to turn my mic on and not blast you again and get my PowerPoint up. So give me 30 seconds to uh, get tech here. It's, it's delightful to be here. I've not only known Mark for 15 years, uh, I've known Guy and many other people uh, from this area for a long time. My only regret is that I couldn't spend longer. I think I must have hit the most beautiful day in the year in this area. You know, the trees are blooming, the wisteria is gorgeous. Uh, but uh, as I told my assistant, I've, I've been outside for all of 45 seconds. So you'll have to have me uh, have me back in some way so that I can enjoy the beautiful uh, area. Thank you for thank you very much for inviting me. Um, what I want to talk to you tonight about is new media, but more importantly, new designs for new media, um, and in some ways, a challenge of some of our traditional assumptions um, and. A number of things have kind of brought me to this point. As Mark said, I've been playing around in interactive media for quite a long time. Um, I started playing around with early systems in 79 and have kind of gone through the whole range of various technologies even before Al Gore invented the internet. Um, so um, I've, I've studied instructions and try to apply it to a number of different kinds of situations. But the real challenge to the traditional ISD model for me was not necessarily new media. Um, back in the mid-70s when I was in graduate school, um, I got a grant to produce a series of instructional videos on Southern and Eastern European um, ethnicity in the United States and how ethnic culture has persisted through the generations. And in doing that project, um, I was trying to apply what I had learned in grad school, like a good girl, you know, the whole sort of needs analysis model of trying to find a subject matter expert and figure out what they do. But in that kind of project, it didn't really work because there wasn't one subject matter expert and there was not one truth or one perspective or one way to think about it. And I wound up developing um, a community or participatory based instructional design model to really get that project done and that formed the basis of my dissertation. Little did I know that years later, decades later, that would come back to serve me in different ways now that we have things called Web 2.0 and social media, where in fact lots of people are the subject matter experts and there is no necessarily one truth. There are many different perspectives about how things should work. And so I want to share a little bit of those perspectives with you along with the challenges that I found in running my own business uh, in trying to help clients produce training and other performance improvement interventions um, and some of the ways that instructional design assumptions and content have helped me in some ways 
where I found it a little bit challenging to apply some of those models. So I'll take you through a little bit of that, a tour of that. But in the meantime, I want to show you some really concrete examples of some of the ways that I've been uh, employing it. Um, I guess one of the things that I talk about in research a, a lot is the changing nature of work. Um, and I think that's one of the things that challenges managers, certainly cha challenges people in training, but jobs are not what they used to be. And I'm sure all of you can nod your head and realize that, that um, jobs are so much more fluid, more demanding, and we've had all this research and writing about the quote knowledge worker, right? And the knowledge worker and how that <coughs> that uh, changes the economy. Well, it really changes what we do. From what, what, what used to be fairly directed performance, um, predictable, standardized. Now, there's still some jobs out there that are like that. And for the jobs and roles and tasks that you can find that are kind of like that, that you know, when people kind of go in and pretty much do the same job every day, you want a number of people to do it very much alike. Uh, they do it in the same location. The, the environment is fairly predictable. Then the kinds of things that I studied back in the 70s about instructional design really do work pretty well. Um, except, I don't know about you, but very few jobs are looking like that anymore. Right? And, and what I find when I work in organizations, although some jobs are like that, that's not necessarily the performance that is challenging the heads of organizations or the CEOs. And we talk about like, you know, what keeps the CEO up at night? It's not necessarily that the CEO can't get 300 people to produce that uh, widget the same way in the, the amount of time that they need to. They're talking about other kinds of challenges. Um, what I'm reading about most now is things like innovation and creativity and engagement and people who can think on the fly. Um, and, that, and that's a very different kind of situation. And those are some of the most important workers and some of the most performant, most important performance that happens in organizations. And so it, it really puts a lot of things that we know on, on their ear. So you know, just to review, what I learned in instructional design is what we kind of call the ADDIE model, and, or a different variance of this, which is you do some kind of analysis, right? You analyze what's the need, do a task analysis, find a master performer, figure out what he or she does, right? Then you take a lot of time to design it. You design it on paper, you try it out. Um, and the assumption here, especially in that design phase, was that production, whatever the production or the development, was pretty hard and expensive to do, and it was pretty hard to change. So back in the uh, Stone Age, when I studied stuff, I was working with video, it was not digital, non-linear video. It was the old-fashioned kind of video that if you had edited up to minute number 15 mm -hmm. and all of a sudden something changed at minute number 10, you redid the whole thing from minute number 10 back over again, right? So production was expensive. It was hard. You know, it took crews to do all this stuff. And so you really had to design it on paper very, very well before you committed to any kind of development or production. So you went into the development, you tried to implement that, rolled it out, and then hopefully did some kind of evaluation, got some feedback on that, and maybe, if you were lucky, did the loop back around to the beginning again. But usually by then you were out of time, out of motivation, and on to the next thing. And that evaluation loop sometimes happened, sometimes didn't. I'm sure you've read all the statistics and you have people talk to you about, you know, doing various kinds of return on investment analysis and, you know, other kinds of analysis. That evaluation often does not happen. 
So that's traditional ISD. And there are many good things about that. The idea of, of careful analysis of the kinds of performance that you want, thinking about design. I mean, all those things are really important, but what I found is a problem is the linearity of it. It's like an assembly line where you know you, you go from analyze to design to develop and you don't go backwards. You know, you're just always moving forward. And the other thing is that the contracts that I would get and the people that I would work with in training departments were basically assigned to a project. They figured out how long it would take to do that. And once they got to the end of it, they were assigned to some other project. It was over. Once the course was launched and done, people were certified, or the design was over, and they were on to the next thing, which was one of the problems why you didn't have that loop very much, that evaluation loop of being able to go back and reanalyze and tweak things. <clears throat> so now enter what I think more people are like at work and what I think some of the more important jobs are in organizations and it's somebody more like that. It's not the assembly line worker right, that we sort of learn. Or if you look at where that Addy model was developed, does anybody know, like, where, where did Addy come from? Software development. Even before software development. Military. Military, okay. So all the, the, the basic Addy model was really done sort of in World War II, where in fact you did have to mobilize a lot of people and you did want their performance very standardized, okay? Um, and of course, jobs have changed, the world has changed, and now more people are in something like this, where they're pretty autonomous, a lot of times they're mobile, right? They're multitasking, they're networked. Um, it's not your traditional employee. So a lot of the important work in organizations is done by people who are working weird hours, they're on the fly, their environment changes a lot, nobody tells them exactly what they have to do when, they're multitasking, they've got to figure out what their priorities are. In fact, one of the things that's quite interesting in organizations is a lot of important work is now outsourced, or it's done by partners or other kinds of teams, so they're not even your employees anymore. It's this mix of people who are not only attending to your task, but maybe working for other organizations or in other environments. And so being able to improve the performance of somebody like this is a lot tougher than being able to engineer the performance of somebody who sort of has the same job in the same cubicle or at the same machine every day. Make sense? So tell me a little bit about how this resonates with you. Are any of you facing situations like this where the people that you're trying to train are a little bit more like this than people who are more defined? Yeah. Okay, so you also need to add attention deficit to that. Oh, yes, there you go, yes. And we don't know whether we do that to people or whether they start out that way. It's, yeah, it's attention deficit, right. I do actually a lot of presentations on the workforce of the future and looking at Gen Y and what their learning styles are, and that comes up all the time. But in, in, you know, how many of you are working with audiences or learners that are more like this? Yeah? Can you give me an example? Uh, well, I focus a lot on project managers who don't have prescriptive ways of doing the things they have to do, but have rules and guidelines and, and like OCC guidelines that they have to follow. Mm -hmm. So it, it is challenging to give them the rules without being prescriptive. Right. Yeah. And, and, and what's really interesting, I wrote an article on this years ago where training may actually decrease performance. And I've seen this in some of my clients where people will be doing a job. For example, I did a lot of work at a big Canadian bank. And they'd hire tellers and they'd just kind of say, okay, well, you know, like watch Susie for a while. 
And, and they'd be doing pretty well, watching Susie and doing the job. And then they'd go, okay, it's time to send you to training. And they'd send them to like a week of training. They would come back and freeze on the job. I saw the same thing happen with a restaurant company that I worked for. Um, people would go through training and they were filling their minds with so many little details like, well, if the table has one iced tea, you put the lemon like this, but if there's more than three people at the table who want an iced tea, then you did the lemons and the little t and the, and a little thing like this and you arrange them like that. And people were, they couldn't do their job. They couldn't wait on people. So in some ways, training is actually backfiring. And what I hear now in organizations, I, I try to read things that are outside our field, like I read Harvard Business Review and the Wall Street Journal and those kinds of things. What I hear organizations talking about is innovation all the time. And what happens is sometimes people are trained so well or they're schooled um, to only do what they're told. They don't think outside the box. And they can do OK, but, but after a certain while, what it is that they know how to do isn't very valuable anymore. And nobody's developing the next best thing. Nobody is thinking outside the box, being more creative. Um, and in fact, we're disabling learners. So we really have to think carefully, and I think especially those of us in ISPI who are not in the business of, pardon the expression, butts and seats, you know, and much more and more training, but we really do look at how do we engineer performance and what is valuable in organizations. We have to step back and say, when may our approaches to training actually hurt people not even only maybe neutral or ineffective, they may actually be hurting people. And so a lot of this that we have to think about, so what is it that organizations want? Um, one of my favorite writer thinkers is Fred Nichols. He has a good website. He's written a lot of stuff. He has the advantage of not having put himself through bachelor's, master's, and PhDs and taking tests. But he is an autodidact, he would say. He's taught himself. Um, and he talks about prefigured and configured work. And prefigured work is what's designed for somebody. Uh, it's very well designed by somebody else. It's designed by the managers. It's like, oh, here's how to do your job. Um, repetitive. And configured work is designed in place in response to the situation. And he wrote this great article, if you just go on to his website there, nichols.us. A bunch of articles, but especially this one called The Autonomous Worker, which he wrote a long time ago, and I think presaged a lot of what we see happening today. So when I look at my own job and the jobs of a lot of people who I think do pretty important work in organizations, this is what at least my life feels like. Now, nobody tells me in, in my day as a dean, my work is not very prefigured at all. I mean, I have a couple of standing meetings and a couple of reports that I have to get in, but I have enormous and very vague expectations, right? I've got to do a ton of things. Um, I've got to recruit faculty and students and get ourselves visible out there and manage the budget. You know, it's like a million things. And nobody tells me, Diane, at 9 o'clock you do this, and you do it exactly this way, right? So here's what's going on in my mind. It's like I sit there and go, like, what do I do next? And my performance is influenced by a lot of things. So it's influenced by the communities around me, my own professional communities, people I work with. It's influenced by my capabilities a lot. Um, I tend to do, like everybody does, what I'm pretty good at. And I tend to avoid the things that I'm not so good at. Right? And so my fellow deans don't operate. I mean, I, I think my day and my approach to doing things, we have five deans, there's probably no similarity except maybe for a couple hours when we both all have to be in a meeting at the same time. But then even in that meeting, we're doing other stuff, of course, on the sly. <laughs> right? So um, it's influenced by all these things, incentives, motivation, whatever. And that's really what guides our performance. Um, and so what's different now, 
Okay, the idea of a master performer is much less relevant than it used to be. <laughs> Um, this idea where we find somebody who does something well and we think we can clone it um, is much less relevant than it used to be. Because as knowledge workers or people who are supposed to come up with creative solutions, we need to do things differently. And what worked yesterday doesn't necessarily work today. So I've seen some examples of this, like when I've coached young professors. Sometimes we have people who are struggling a little bit and they'll go and watch somebody else. They'll watch another professor and they'll go try to be that person. Oh my God, it's a, you know, you're just shaking your heads. It's a, a complete disaster. What you need to do is you've got to be yourself, which is a harder thing to do. It's really bad when they try to imitate somebody else. Um, the shelf life of content is incredibly short. Even if we can pin something down, my experience is by the time you get something done, the content has changed. So you're always kind of chasing your tail there. Um, so the performance needs to react to the change much more quickly than we used to. Um, right now, the problem is not that we don't have information, but in fact that we have an abundance of information. So a lot of the assumption of training in ISD was that there is a lack of information, and now there's not a lack of information. In fact, there's too much. And this whole idea of crowdsourcing, or the idea that you can send questions or problems out to a crowd to solve it very quickly, is much, is, it, it, that's the way that things get done. So for example, if you look at how do young people solve a problem, they don't approach it in an academic, stepwise way, the way that we do. They don't go to a, like an encyclopedia or take a class, right? They go online, they find a bunch of things, they try to figure out where it agrees, where it doesn't agree, and they crowdsource the problem. They use their networks to say, here's my problem, here's my question, and they, a bunch of people weigh in on it, right? Um, and so that's the way performance happens especially with young people, and increasingly in the workplace, that's how it happens as well. Uh, because things can't necessarily all be documented. So this idea of having communities of performers or learners, whether we organize them or not, they're happening. And they're probably more influential than formal training. That's where, the, that's where it really happens. So is it different? It's different, but when I step back, that's the way human beings always learned and performed. And it's only that the last maybe 40 years were an aberration, you know, that everything was very prescribed uh, in terms of training. There was always much more of a community and social input to learning. And so, really the audience is becoming the producer of a lot of it. And our job, instead of being necessarily the producer with the ADDIE model, is that we're more like air traffic control. The information is out there. People are going to access it whether we want them to or not. And what we need to do is make sure that as all this information is flying around, that it doesn't crash into each other. So our role, I mean, I think there still is an, an extremely important role for instructional designers. But it's a real different one than a model where there was a paucity of information and very static kinds of information needs. Real challenge these days. So I don't really have an absolutely set so people go, oh, OK, so Diane, what's the new thing? I think it looks something like this. Um, I think it's a more iterative process, and so, you know, there always was supposed to be this kind of loop. And I also think that we still analyze things. Instead of saying necessarily design and develop, I think we prototype things, we socialize it, we try it out, and then we tweak it, and that's a constant loop. And I'll show you some things that are developed using that model. Now, I don't think this is any great insight because I think that's what we are doing. Any of you who have a job right now in training, that is what you're doing. You're not doing ISD. 
we just don't formalize it. We think we're doing something wrong or we're skipping steps or whatever and we're beating ourselves up that we're not doing ISD. You can't do ISD anymore, right? Not the way that, not the Addy kind of static model that we used to. We're all doing something like this. But I think if we formalize it and talk about it in this way, it will help us manage our projects a little bit and explain what we do to our clients a little bit better. So analysis skills are very important, but what I find now is that instead of trying to analyze something that's going to become some huge long course, we need to try to find out what's the most important need or what's most critical and prototype that and get that out very quickly. Now, I've been in situations where clients will come to me and they want some huge long course. And it may be months before we get it out. And what that makes me think about is, what are the mistakes that are happening in the six months that it's taking to get this course out? And, and aren't there a couple of things that even if we could get three things out, like do not do this under any circumstances, <laughs> Absolutely, do not do these things, and here's a couple of good concepts, and stay tuned and we'll be back to you later. But in the meantime, you know, almost kind of taking a triage approach to things. Um, and I think a lot of things can be done in a very prototyping mode. And audiences go for it. I mean, if you look at all the social media and Twitter and things, is Twitter beautiful? Of course it's not. It's just text, right? But if that Twitter message or even an email message gets something out really important like when this blows, do not replace all A, B, C, D, and E, just tighten the, the, the D screw and you'll save yourself a lot of time and money, you know, that's, that's great in and of itself. So we can kind of prototype things, socialize it, get it out there and say, does this make sense? Do you have a better idea? Where does this work? Where does it not work? So we're putting out information more as a hypothesis rather than an absolute prescription. I think people always know this. I think for a while, for a long time, we've been living lies. That we do training courses, employees will sit through those courses, they'll say, you know, I know they want answer D. And unless I put D on the test, I'm not going to get through the e-learning or I'm not going to pass the test. Now I know that it doesn't work for me. <laughs> it might work for all these other people, but I'm going to answer it anyhow just to get through the stuff. And nobody would really admit that, well, maybe D is a good answer 90% of the time, but oh my god, in 10% of the time, if you did it that way, you're going to be in a disaster. But we were all in this sort of little lie, like, you know, just keep your mouth shut, answer D, I'll get my program done, you'll get certified, and we'll all go home, right? Um, and, and I think now, with social media, and with the ability to very quickly get feedback, we can be more honest about those things. Now certainly, there are areas that are very technical, very specific, have high risk, in which you don't play around. There is one way to do things. There are things that you absolutely cannot do. You do have to be very careful in designing things. But I think for many, many jobs now, having a faster model of being able to get things out quickly and as you socialize it, you tweak it, and that analysis happens very quickly. And that cycle can happen 16 times a day, right? You don't have this very long project that goes on, and nobody gets any information for six months because the whole course is not designed, right? It happens much more, in a much more fluid manner. So, um, if you look at e-learning, the whole sort of palette of information that we have to work with. Um, unfortunately, this is, I hope your handouts have a whole thing, because somehow this is cutting things up, and I don't think I can get up there and do anything about it. Um, but anyhow, as performance consultants, we can look at e-learning, not only as learning, but uh, a variety of things that, that we can use. So I, I look at it in two dimensions. One is bandwidth, high bandwidth or low bandwidth. Basically, 
rich media versus very simple media, maybe expensive versus inexpensive, harder to produce, easy to produce. Um, and then across the top, what's your purpose? Is it just information? Is it instruction? Is it collaboration? Or is it automation? And we know as sort of a foundation of performance technology, that training is not the answer to every problem. In fact, it's probably one of the most expensive and in some cases least effective <laughs> solutions. But if you look at, if you have a client though who comes to you and says, I want e-learning, one approach to say is rather than give them the whole performance technology <coughs> lecture, um, is to say we have a whole palette of quote e-learning tools and here's the range and what do you need? Is it just information? Um, by information, I mean that people need to be aware of something. They don't necessarily have to memorize it. Um, it, it. It may not take practice and conceptual skills and a lot of design, but it's just it's information that just needs to be out there. So there's a whole variety of things that we can use for that. I'm going to show some examples of these. Um, in cases where you really do need instruction, People really need to learn it. Do they, need, do they really need to memorize it? And does it take some design to get them to be able to assimilate this concept, learn it, and be able to act on it? And there's a whole variety of tools, e-learning kinds of tools, that we can work with there. Um, in other cases, it's more of a collaboration problem. So in some cases, there is not a solution, there's not a way to do things, it's not memorization. In fact, to get a job done, you need to put a number of minds together. And people with different specialties, and they can help each other, they can mentor each other. It's a whole variety of collaboration tools. And then in some cases, we say, <coughs> they don't need to learn it at all, they just need a job aid, or they need to have it automated. And there's a whole variety of things from very simple to very complex that will automate a job for them. And I'll give you some examples of all of these, but I think this is an important sort of way for us to think about the whole set of tools. And in fact, for any given problem, you probably don't want just one of those. You probably need to look at a given performance problem and say, some of it is information. You know, we're just going to announce this, this change is going to happen. Um, some of it, people may really need to have to memorize. Other things, they may need to work together. And other things, you may just need to automate it so that people don't have to strain their brain at all. Um, so I kind of came up with this flow chart. And this is based a lot on Robert Nager, who, uh, whom I studied back in the early 70s. And his book and, and flow charts about analysis are still some of the best thinking tools and concepts that I've ever used. But I've modified it a little bit to look at where do we use various kinds of interactive media. So we'll take you through a couple of these. So if we start at the top and, and ask Mager's question, could they do it if their lives depended on it? This is the thing that my students always remember that. Uh, Megan would say, if you put a gun to their head, could they do it? And that helps you decide, is this a training problem or is it not a training problem? So we start there at the top. Could they do it if their lives depended on it? And we say, no, they couldn't. And then we ask another question. Well, could they ever do it? Could they do it in the past? And if you say yes, well, it's, you have a different kind of intervention. If somebody used to be able to do something and now that somehow they've lost that skill or they're not doing it anymore, we can give them, for example, a simulation or a drill and practice to refresh their skills. You don't need to go back to something um, more complicated than that. And there are a ton of e-learning kinds of strategies that will help you do that. Typical drill and practice, for example. So if you've forgotten bones in the hand or you know, if you've forgotten or need more practice on your square roots, there are all kinds
kinds of little automated drill and practice, little flashcards that you can use. One of the cool things is there are a lot of iPhone apps that are really good at doing this. So for example, I used to be a pretty good musician. I did a little bit of music theory. I've unfortunately kind of gotten out of it. But one of the iPhone apps I have is ear training. And it will play different notes. And you have to recognize what the note is or what the pattern of notes is or what the interval is. And it's, it's just a fun thing to do if you're sitting around and don't have anything else to do. And it's, it comes back. I don't need to be trained in what is a major seventh. I knew that. My ear just needs the refreshing on it. And so you can, you can do a lot of really interesting applications that way. Um, in, uh, you can use simulations. Um, one of the things we did, this is a screenshot from a program we developed uh, for a bank. And it was, what to, for tellers, what do you do if you're held up? And what we found is that before you get to be a teller, you are trained in all these procedures. And you're trained in the little secret buttons and the fancy cash that explodes that you know you give out and all that sort of thing. So they knew it. But unless they, were ref they had a lot of refreshers on it, they would not really be able to carry it out. And in fact, they were mandated to do this kind of training yearly. Um, and what we did is a video program. Uh, and this is our cameraman, and this is the robber, uh, and this is a, the shooting from the perspective of a teller, so you can just kind of see your hands, and they just go right into the video. There's no training. They turn it on, and boom, you know, you're kind of like, from the point of view of a teller, you're serving customers. This guy walks up, and all of a sudden, boom, there's a gun right in your face. And it's like, what do you do? And immediately, you have to react. So there are some pretty cool things like that. We did another simulation for a company that did banking training on how to uh, work with seasonal loans. And again, there really wasn't training. You were, this is, was a rough prototype, but the whole thing uh, starts out where a call, uh, kind of a, a call slip comes up and says, you know, Mr. Jones called while you were out. He wants you to return his call about his loan, you know, uh, his loan. And then you have your choice of what do you do next? Do you, you can click on the phone and talk to the guy. You can click on the file cabinet and bring out his file. You could click on a little manual to learn more about seasonal loans. You could call your boss, but you kind of work through the problem till, till you get to the end where you have to make a recommendation to the loan committee. And after that, you're given some advice as to how you did. Either you kind of played around much too long and the customer has gone to somebody else, or you answered too quickly and the loan committee denied you, blah, blah, blah. But um, there are a lot of, and, and what's interesting about both of these programs is there was really no teaching involved except seeing the consequences. Because people did, they had known it, they just needed really the practice of doing it and to see consequences. Uh, there are really fancier things to do now that a number of universities have what they call these caves, which are immersive media environments in which you can play around with various um, kinds of things as if you're really in the environment. Um, so we'll look at another one as we work our way down the flowchart. Um, if they could do it if their lives depended on it, um, and they couldn't do it in the past. Uh, and you're not sure whether they have the aptitude to do it. That's another really important question that Mayer would ask. And, and I found this a lot. Sometimes organizations try to train people who don't really have the aptitude to do a particular job. And what they really need is to step back and say, are you really trying to train the right people? or? Do you really need to rethink the qualifications for this job and really start out with very different people? And sometimes you don't know whether they have the qualifications to do that or not. I've been in a number of cases where jobs changed so much that really people didn't even have, either have the personality or the inclination or the ability to do the job, and you were just trying to train them to do something that wasn't going to fit them. Um, 
And in those cases, you can use various kinds of interactive assessment to find that out before you waste a lot of time training them. And one of the good things about um, doing interactive assessment is that it can be branching. So that if people are getting a lot of answers right, they get branched to something much more advanced, right? They don't, let's say you have a 100 item test. Instead of having somebody go through all 100 items as it gets harder and harder, you figure out where they are. And if they're starting to fail, like at the first five, you pretty much know they're there. If somebody looks like they're very capable, you can jump them right ahead into other things. And there are a lot of tools out there that will allow you to create those kinds of branching assessments. And I found that it saves organizations a ton of time. Um, in one particular organization that I've worked with, it's an insurance company, and the job had changed very much for the people who had to answer calls from um, either medical providers or the people who had the insurance and they were not satisfied with one of the solutions. What happened is all the easy things were computerized and the only thing that came to the agents were the really tough things and they really had the wrong workforce. One of the things, that, and when I asked them, well, how do you decide who should get these jobs? What kind of testing do you do? They said, well, we give them a typing test yeah. because they have to use computers. Oh, and I was like, huh, yeah, oh, Jesus, right. They were at the point of 12 weeks of training for these people before they started their job. Now, I'm pretty patient. I sat through a PhD. I sat through an hour, and I was ready to stick pencils in my eyes. I don't know how. And well, in fact, most of the people dropped out before they ever got through the training. And a lot of the problem was that they were not suited for the job. They were testing typing and they were testing analytical skills. What made them good on the job is could they read and do some analysis while they talked to angry physician man office managers or confused old people. And confused old people who don't have anybody to talk to all day and want to talk a lot. Right? And that's what made you successful. And in fact, what we did is told people that the company that they needed to completely redo the job description, change the, the job ad posting that was going to be in the, in the newspaper Monday, and they, cut, they could cut out weeks and weeks of their training. It was, it was probably the cheapest solution, but, uh, but a really good one. And so these kinds of interactive assessment things really should not be uh, ignored. And of course, you can do a lot of things like software simulations or whatever to be able to see what people can do. Other kinds of proficiency tests. I mean, in fact, if you do want a typing test or do want other things, there are, things, there are all kinds of things that will you know, time your errors and your speed and that sort of thing. And it's a good thing to think about. Um, so we'll look at some more questions, OK? Again, um, if we come down to, they couldn't do it if their lives depended on it. Uh, they do have the aptitude to do it. Um, but why is it that they are really not doing it? They may, in fact, need a very, uh, some kind of tutorial system. And of course, with rich media and hyperlinks, you can do some very interesting tutorials. This is probably what people think of when you say e-learning. They think of something that's on a screen, people read something, there are some, in this case, this is uh, for a pharmaceutical company uh, about a particular kind of disease and how you treat it, and so you're watching very high-end animations and asking questions about it, uh, you're being tested as you go, you can go back and see hyperlinks, uh, very rich kind of media, exceedingly expensive, it's very cool, very effective, it's a lovely design, um, unbelievably expensive. And this is what I recommend as the last resort. Uh, if you've tried everything else, if you tried assessments and job aids and whatever, and you really need to train people and they need this rich kind of resource, these kinds of tutorials can be very, very effective. They do have to be designed in the right way though so that the assessment part of it is meaningful. And here's where I think a lot of the downfall is. If people don't know how to use 
questions very well. And questions are the key to doing a good tutorial. Um, one of the things is you can use questions as a pretest, as a post-test. They can be embedded knowledge checks. You can ask questions to get to know the learner just so you, like you would in any other class. If you were going to teach, the, the idea of interactive media, what got me turned on so much years ago is, it will be personalized, just like having your own tutor. And it can relate to your own learning style, and it can give you examples, and it can go at the speed that you want. How many programs have you ever seen that do that? They're laughing now. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of e-learning is PowerPoint with a couple of questions added. And although that can work sometimes, and there are a lot of tools that will help you, quote, do that, it's not necessarily very effective. If you do this, what you need to do is write the questions first. What people will do is they develop learning, and because of the adding model, because the E of evaluation comes last, they build the whole course, and then they write the questions later. Well, that worked when we have a factory model of having to put people through learning and give them a test at the end. That's like the old college or school model. That's not what e-learning does. If you write questions first, it enables you to get at what, what are the common misconceptions. And then when people get things right or wrong, it allows you to either slow them down or speed them up. So if you, if you have to do a tutorial, the way to do it is do an analysis and then write your questions, and based on your questions, then you write the content. Uh, and questions are all important. Um, you need to go back to the objectives, make sure they're not tricky, overly tricky. Uh, you have to find out what are the common misconceptions. So I've seen a lot of interactive media that ask stupid questions that don't have anything to do with the objectives. It's just to see whether you're paying attention. So what you really need to do, and, and, and what happens is that people will write these things and go, oh, people got all the questions right. My, my instruction was so effective. All the learners got 100%. Well, of course, you're asking idiotic questions. Or, especially with multiple choice questions, Anybody could figure out the right answer, right? You, you know, you could get anybody off the street who never saw the program. It's just obvious. Now, multiple choice testing, especially, is not easy to develop. Uh, and one of the things that I lament is that people are very happy to spend all kinds of money having people develop all kinds of flashy animation and music or whatever, and they don't spend the time getting a professional to write the tests. <laughs> So you really need to field check them, and you don't expect people to get them all right. I mean, again, we're back to the school model where we think everybody needs to get them all right. Well, the power of interactive media is that you should be getting some things wrong so that you can challenge them. If everybody gets everything right, everybody sees the whole thing, and then you might as well give them a book. Then it's linear. If you want it to be nonlinear, you want people to get some things wrong so that you can provide the right feedback and remediation. So, you know, you can do true-false, they're easy, they're easy to write, but they usually don't get to anything complex, they're usually easy to guess. So, you know, that's one way to do it. Multiple choice questions, multiple guess. It really is hard to come up with good distractors you know, the, the items that are wrong. They're easy to program, but the other thing is, when you go back to your objectives, they usually test recognition rather than retention, right? So if I, at, let's say I'm a sales rep and I have to remember the name of some drug off the top of my head, you don't want to use a multiple choice item because then I'll, I know it if I see it. But, you know, you need, to, you need to decide what level of learning you need to get at, right? And so, unfortunately, a lot of interactive media, because it's easy to, per, it's easy to do multiple choice, all, everything is reduced to that, and therefore the evaluation is not necessarily very good. Um, so, for example, you, you will see uh, questions like this. 
let's, which one is the, the correct answer? <laughs> 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 Let's see. Yeah, it's, it's usually, if you had a guess, now we don't know this, we haven't studied this, probably number two, the second one, because it's the longest and most qualified. Um, it's probably, and also, it's probably not on the roof. That's stupid, right? Under the refrigerator, that, that's probably not right. That's hard to get to. Probably not in the sink. You know, it's, so we see a lot of questions like this, and this is what, the kind of questions that novices um, write, or something like this, where, <laughs> what's the right answer there? And, right. So the, uh, it's only the last one because it's and. Okay, so a lot of times here are the common misconceptions. The correct answer is the longest. Uh, incorrect answers may contain words that were never used in the presentation. I see people doing this all the time. They don't know what the heck you're saying. They just pick up these words, you know, and they go, oh, that must be the right answer. I heard that word. Or if they never use the word, that must be the wrong answer or their grammatical giveaways, or one question will give the answer to the rest of the questions. So you've got to be really careful when you build tutorials not to make some of those mistakes. Um, you can also use matching or drag and drop. Some of those things are quite good for like paired associations. Uh, but again, a lot of times people will use a process of elimination to guess at what they finally do. And people will say, well, they finally got to it. Yeah, they tried everything. You know, and then they finally got to the end of it. Do they really know? They don't really know it. They're just playing. They're not really paying attention. Uh, fill in questions is what you need if it's for retention, because you can't necessarily guess it. But the problem there is it can be harder to program. Uh, and if people are using synonyms or things, uh, sometimes you're telling them they're wrong when they're really not wrong. They just use a synonym or they had some kind of typo or something, uh, and so that could be a little bit harder. Um, one of the things that I like to do when I've done these kind of tutorials is to ask them questions and use that as a variable and use it later on, and it does seem like it's very interactive. And, uh, you know, I've done some things that were almost like those old simulations of, um, of someone visiting a psychotherapist. So it's like, hello, you know, tell me why are you here today? I hate my mother. Tell me why you hate your mother. <laughs> you know, and it just takes the variable that you typed in and says something with it. It can be phony, but there can be some interesting ways that you can build on capturing people's words and kind of creating a conversation around it. I don't see much of that these days, though. Um, and of course you can do more advanced interactions with simulations where you're using sliders and moving objects and other kinds of input devices. Um, but if you're doing tutorials, then the feedback is very important. It can be immediate, it can be delayed, or some of both. But how you provide it is also very, very important. And one of the things is you have to make sure that you're not just kind of sarcastic. Like, I see a lot of programs like this. So if people get something right, it's like, great, you're the most brilliant person I've ever seen. Let's move on. Or if you get it wrong, you're in this endless loop of wrong, try again, wrong, try again, <laughs> wrong, try again. So it, it can be challenging to develop these in some ways. Other real, other sophisticated things that you can do, you can branch based on subscores. So as you're working through a tutorial, you figure out how people are doing. Are they doing really well and quickly? Are they kind of struggling? So as, let's say you have 50 questions in a tutorial, at a certain point, you can see like a question number 20, how are they doing? And move them to a different version that makes use of that knowledge. Again, that's what you would do if you were sitting down with a person. Say, boy, you're catching on really fast. You know, I'm going to pick up the speed, or I'm going to use this example. Somebody else, um, I don't think they're that confident. Maybe they need some more time on it. You can branch on the kinds of responses they make. 
uh, use variables to incorporate their own words into it, uh, use random events, use timing, have users collaborate on it, and you know, overall make it kind of a performance tool. So there are really important things that can be done in the testing and assessment that again is not at the end, it's in the middle of all this. So again, it's sort of where does the Addy model come in? If you ask the right kinds of questions, you're going to be analyzing the learner as they're going through it and learning more about your audience and creating different kinds of programs as they shape the program. The audience really is the, kind of, is, is the producer. Um, and now what we're seeing a lot of is online seminars and the kinds of social media where, in fact, instead of talking to a programmed uh, computer, you're talking to each other. Um, I've done some teaching for Boise State, and this is what their environment looks like. And their graduate <coughs> programs, it's all online, but it's mostly, it's run like a seminar. It's people talking to one another. There's very little that's programmed. It's mostly conversational. So these are just, you know, a couple of the kinds of screens for it, where people will be commenting on what other people say. They'll quote each other, and then this person, Brenda, will comment on what Marcia said, and they build on um, one another. And then it kind of goes on. So in those cases, when you're building something like this, as an instructional designer, you're really building the shell, and what's most important is a live instructor who <coughs> takes you through it. And the instructor has to look for convergent activity to facilitate it. They have to bring people back on track. They may hint at what the right answers are. When students meander, you know, again, the instructor refers them back. But it's much more dependent on an in-the-moment instructor. So as you look at what kinds of tutorials do you want to build, is it something that kind of runs on its own or is canned, or is it something like this which takes almost no pre-design, but it takes a very experienced instructor to be there all the time. And having done this, we sign on like probably every three hours to get give people feedback and make sure that things are things are going very well. This is all done in an asynchronous manner. And a lot of a lot of teamwork. So for example, this is one of the courses that I had. We divided people up into different teams to work on projects. Um, and we also had people work on various case studies. So we'll look at another um, a, a, another form of interactive media, and that is if people could not do it if their lives depended on it. They really do need to be trained. Um, and so we can do simulations. Of course, interactive media is great for simulating, letting people play with um, in, in uh, jobs that are otherwise very dangerous. Um, one thing that I think is very interesting now uh, is these kind of what-if calculators. If you're looking at how do people learn when they have a choice to on their own with things like finances. People don't necessarily go and read books on personal finance anymore. Right? They don't go through tutorials. They, do, they want to play in a what-if environment. So this is like a, their own simulation. So what happens to your mortgage payment if you pay more, $50 more, or whatever. And allowing people to play and develop their own concepts is something that's uh, very, very appealing especially to a younger generation that does not want to be lectured to. Um, you can also use interactive media to give a performance scorecard to give people feedback. Um, I worked with the Ontario Lottery and Gaming Corporation, and they had a problem to, in getting their managers to uh, follow through on some of their action plans. And this was a way that we kind of posted an online scoreboard for all these casinos that were all over, all over uh, the province of Ontario. And they could see how they were doing compared to other people. And that was very effective. They didn't need to be trained. They just needed to be embarrassed. <laughs> um, 
And, and so now some of the things that we're getting into, for example, is portals. Um, many organizations, I think a college included, has a portal now that enables us to bring together various pieces of software. So we have email here, intercom is our newsletter, um, this is our Oracle calendar. These all exist as separate software applications, but this brings them all together. Now, ideally, I mean, this is the way that we can organize ourselves. So this is my picture, right? This is my dashboard. This is how I drive my day. I kind of look at this and say, okay, so here's what's going on. Here's news both from Ithaca College. Here's my email that I need to respond to. Here's what I need to be doing, my calendar for the day. And these are some of the most important announcements. But what's cool about this is that we can also customize it. So on this page, I can decide what news I want to bring in, uh, both from Ithaca College and other sources. Because now so many sources have RSS feeds. Anything else with an RSS feed, I can pull in. So depending on my job, I can pull in stuff that's important to me. If I was, if I was in the purchasing department, there are probably newsletters and magazines and purchasing that I drag in here. I, like to, I need to read like the Chronicle of Higher Ed. And you can see this, is, this comes up as a template, but you can drag and create your own. So if I'm interested in sports, I can do this. If I don't want to see sports, I can get rid of this and put something else in there. So that's like an aggregated personal newspaper. And that's very useful, uh, especially in executive decision making, to be able to see what's going on out there. So again, if you look at what's important to CEOs and how do you get people engaged and how do you stimulate creativity, um, years ago, one of my clients came to me and said, our engineering department needs training. And I said, why? And he said, well, they're not seen as responsive and creative. <laughs> okay, so how do you train somebody to be responsive and creative? Well, what it came down to is that they were good engineers, but they didn't know what was really going on in the pharmaceutical industry and they weren't necessarily being faced with what the competition was doing. And so what we did very early on is create a very early portal that was like this, that fed them news that they needed about their own profession and about how the competition <coughs> was uh, you know, eating their lunch. And so all of a sudden, they seemed like they were not only more motivated, but they were better able to partner with their internal clients because they could speak their language because now they were reading the kinds of stuff that their executives would read. Now all of a sudden they're responsive, right? They're responsive because they speak the right language and they're motivated. So these kinds of things, although you know, one would not call it a training tool, this is IT or this is employee communications, it's a very important training tool. It's a, it's a very important part of the arsenal. Um, and now we can make our own tabs. So, for example, if I taught English 101, I could make my own tab uh, with either resources that I created or other things that I would want students to have. And so you can kind of put together your own little tabs, and that's a way to provide not only news but education. Um, other things that go on in organizations is in terms of feedback. Again, if you use the performance technology framework, sometimes all people need is feedback. They know how to do it. They're just not motivated or they're not getting good enough feedback. Uh, and there are systems like these that are a lot, they're used a lot in call centers where they're big flat screens and they will show, unfortunately this is kind of blurry, but it will show how many calls are in the queue and what the average response time is. But then they'll have other things over here like, you know, when what today's meeting is going to be. They might have sports scores. They might have other kinds of things. It's something very attractive. And people are getting minute to minute feedback on how their unit is doing. Blogs and feeds, people are doing a lot. Uh, managers do blogs. People who are subject matter experts will do blogs. Uh, and the 
interesting thing about a blog is it's not only a way to kind of comment on things and link to things, but if you syndicate it or do an RSS feed, then that can go into your portal or it can go into a reader on your iPhone or your mobile app. And so people can keep track of what certain people are thinking and doing. And again, this is a, an important part of social learning, both in capturing knowledge and being able to disseminate things very quickly. Um, in some cases, we need to find out more about people's values or questions, uh, or uh, values, or to find out what they're, uh, to assess them in some way uh, in needs <coughs> analysis. Um, I've used interactive tools a lot. I use SurveyMonkey all the time to do various kinds of needs assessment. So, for example, one of the things I was asked to do a presentation on intergenerational issues or conflict at work for a casino in Connecticut. And instead of just arriving and going through my spiel, before I went, I posted this and gave them a link and did a little bit of a, needs ana a quick needs analysis just using SurveyMonkey. So ask them, you know, have you experienced intergenerational conflict in your work group? And if they had, um, invited them to give us examples. Um, and in some of these cases, if they did give us an example, uh, at the end, if they wanted to volunteer, provide their name and their phone number or email. So when we went in to do the workshop, we said, well, Pat here wrote that, you know, she had an incident a month ago and blah, 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 blah. Pat, would you like to talk about it? So we immediately started and it was addressing their needs instead of just dumping information on them, it, it, became, it became real to them, it became real issues, and we also started the collaboration, because then people knew, oh, Pat, you solved it that way, and somebody else solved something another way or had another issue. So after we left, instead of just saying goodbye and good luck, people had already made the contact with one another. And of course, this was easy to do and free. Um, so it becomes part of, it became not only our needs analysis, but this is what we showed when we started the workshop. Well, you know, here's what your questions are, let's address them. You can also use interactivity for team building and online discussion groups. Um, this is a really cool thing, and this is where I see very expensive, but these are going to be the kind of canned programs that we might want to look at. Um, this is called Build Your Own Business. It's an online multiplayer simulation. Uh, it started out uh, from a guy in Canada who taught hospitality management. And for most hospitality students, their capstone course is they've got to sort of manage a restaurant or manage a bar. But it was usually done in a very dry way. Well, here we capitalize on young people's love of gaming and social networking. And this is brilliant. I mean, it's a game, it's learning, it's advertising, it's everything. It's really brilliant. So it started out as build your own bar, now it's build your own business. Um, students subscribe to it the way that they would buy a textbook. The instructor in a university adopts it the way that they would adopt it, uh, a textbook. And then the students go online, and it's kind of like SimCity where you get to build your own business. Now, if you're in hospitality, your instructor might say it has to be a restaurant or a bar. If you're in business, it could be other things. So students go online, and as the semester unfolds, just like in SimCity, things happen. So let's say that you want to, uh, you want to have a bar in Key West, Florida, and all of a sudden it's going really well, and then all of a sudden you get a hurricane, and the whole, you know, your whole bar is destroyed. Now what are you going to do? The other cool thing is, you not only play against each other, but students post their resumes. And anybody can hire anybody else. So I can say, oh, your bar is doing pretty well, and I think your bar is doing pretty well because you have this great menu planner, him. Guess what? I'm going to go to him. I'm going to make him a higher offer. I'm going to steal him away from you. And I'm going to see your resume online. So this gives then, at the end, 
instructors are getting metrics on how students have applied various skills and concepts to run their business. But they are really posting their resumes and they get underwritten by companies like Marriott who actually want to hire bright young people. That's where the money comes from. So if you're a winner, you're not only going to get an A in Dr. G's class, you're probably going to get a call from Marriott because you were the best food planner or you had the best uh, ideas of a new restaurant concept. So it's really interesting. It kind of breaks all the rules of is it a game, is it learning, is it assessment, is it a um, job board, is it collaboration? Yes, it's, it's all those things. It was very expensive, but because you can do it literally worldwide now, there are hundreds of universities that use it. And I think it's, it's starting in corporate training as well. Um, because so many hundreds of people use it, they have the resources to build something sophisticated like this. So I think uh, if you want to see it, it's called, build, if, you, if you Google build your, own, uh, build your own business and it's in Canada, so it has a .ca at the end of it. Um, you can play the videos, it's really pretty cool. Um, and of course, you know, organizations are doing all kinds of ad hoc online communities. A lot of organizations are using things like Facebook, to keep orientation groups together and connected. So if a bunch of people go to a particular class to keep that network going, they, they, they create their own Facebook. They're using things like YouTube. So Deloitte to come up with a way to engage their, their uh, workforce. Instead of going and just doing some expensive campaign, they said make a video of why it's great to work here. And they had a competition and people posted their own videos of why it's great to work there. It got tons of publicity. It made it a cool place to work for bright young people. So isn't that, I mean, you have to do a lot less training if you have bright and engaged young people who think it's way cool to work there. They'll teach themselves, right? They'll beat their path, the path to your door. So it was a great way to do it and a great way to capture, in fact, what people thought was good about working at Deloitte. So really interesting applications of you know, the kind of team building and engagement that you need for really high performance. Uh, and then, you know, I guess the final thing is when you don't need training, you don't need team, team building, sometimes you just need to have somebody do something for you. So this is something I built a, t a long, long time ago. Um, my client is a manufacturer of diesel heaters that went in diesel trucks or school buses um, and especially um, for fleets that worked in cold weather. So if you know about diesels, in cold weather they won't start. Uh, and so you either have to keep them in a heated garage or you plug them into electricity or you keep them running. And it was of course a big pollution problem because in, in the north, especially in Canada, um, truckers would keep these diesel trucks running all night when they slept. So this is a solution to that. But it was hard to sell because there were lots and lots of different models. They had to be spec right. It, it was something that looked very expensive. So you had to understand how to sell the payback on it. And the people who sold it were in stores that sold basically truck parts. So they were selling thousands of things. This was like one of a thousand things. So they kept trying and trying and trying to teach the sales force how to sell this. They had turnover, they didn't get to do it often enough, they'd do it wrong, they'd screw up. And so they came to me saying, can you make a training video, whatever, I said, no, you do not need training. In fact, get these people out of it, they're never going to get it right. They are more harm than good. Um, even if you could train them, they're going to turn over too fast. So we basically did a job aid. And it allowed a customer to enter his or her own data. So this is somewhere in the middle of it where you kind of say how many trucks do you have in your fleet and how many you know, weeks do you go that you know, has weather that's this cold or whatever. And it, at, it would keep your estimates. So it would tell you that your initial cost would be this. Um, and you can kind of continue and enter your own. And basically, you sold yourself on the system. It took the salesperson 
out of the loop. We, and in fact, in this case, training was hurting them because it would never be effective enough. They would always screw up and they'd get customers angry with them. So our solution was get them out of the loop and automate the system. It was actually extremely easy to program. It was just a series of calculations. Um, Coast Guard won an ISPI award for um, a pond of, um, application for when they board uh, a vessel to inspect it, they just do it all on the Palm computer. Um, same thing about wikis in terms of being able to collectively capture knowledge. Um, lots of other newer approaches and tools. This was an example of a website that, as I say, I think this exemplifies to me this sort of analyze, you know, prototype, tweak. Um, this company came to me and wanted to teach their um, district managers financial analysis. And they tried it in two weeks of class and it was a complete disaster. So they said, well, let's do it on e-learning. And they literally gave me about 3,000 PowerPoint slides that had been done in two weeks. And they said, make this into e-learning. And I said, there is no amount of money in the world that you could tempt me with to do this. No way in hell. So again, I said, OK, people need to do this quickly. What are the most important principles that they need? We were able, within two weeks, to create this little website. Yes, it does look completely ugly. I admit to it. But you know what? People didn't care that it was clip art. So what we did is kind of created a job aid. Here's how to start out with having a, a conversation. We went to Terry Shaw over the phone, and uh, he, Terry was identified as a guy who was good at talking to customers. I said, Terry, let's just record you as if you're talking to a customer. And we captured that. If you click here, you hear the conversation. We kind of came up with a simple job aid. Instead of teaching them analysis and all these calculations. I mean, again, it's not a university course. We had an Excel spreadsheet that was automa automatically would populate things. You just put in the, the things and it did the calculations. Now, did they know why it was calculating it? No. Did they need to know why? No. They were not getting PhDs in finance. All they needed to know was how to do it. So we did that. We also did an email the expert. We said, who in your company does know how to do this pretty well because these guys are being deployed and we called it sort of like volunteer fire person. And an expert would be on duty for a week and all they would say is for this week I agree to take calls and answer emails within an hour and help people as they have problems. And we had a discussion group. We had a couple pages of the most important content and based on the questions the experts would get and the discussion group, then we developed content only as it was needed. We would see what their real questions were, what were their struggles. We would either develop content or templates or little audio uh, models or examples of things to do. And it was all, now here's where I'm stupid. They would have given me a lot of money and the client was willing to, they thought it was gonna be a year long project. And I did it in two weeks for not very much money. So they're happy and uh, I'm poor. <laughs> um, but, you know, we see this now with the kinds of uh, certificate programs we're doing at Ithaca are very much the same. There are two week long seminars that are very oriented to the, the questions that people have facilita facilitated by um, an expert. I also use wikis for de collaborative development with my clients. Um, I had um, uh, I was working with clients in the Navy, and we used a wiki as a way to store all of our project materials. Uh, this is a simple example of participatory content development. Again, this is a utility company that wanted to teach business practices. It's basically a job aid, but what, in addition to just being able to call up job aids, you could click this button to submit a request for a new procedure. So let's say I'm a manager and I want to know how to, what to do when somebody goes on maternity leave. And I look at the drop down menu and it's not there. 
I can click here and say, please write a you know, job aid or description on what to do when somebody goes on maternity leave, and please have somebody get back to me immediately. And we put in the challenge button. Let's say I clicked on manage phone costs, I read the whole thing and I go, that's a bunch of BS. That, that doesn't work, I think I have a better way. I could read it, I could press the challenge button, <coughs> type in what I think is a better answer. Instructional designers collected that, they would vet it and use that to improve their processes. So again, this stuff is ugly. Yeah, it, it is ugly, but it works, it's fast. And is this analysis, is it training, is it, it's all of the above. Uh, and so, you know, again, I think we're going to have more of these um, sort of workflow management systems, portals, that become our, the dashboard for the knowledge workers. Um, podcasting is another thing that people are starting to do very effectively to capture their own and to, um, a Capital One actually uses audible.com as a subscription format to update their executives. Um, and, you know, I think what we're seeing, people are using their buddy list as their path, their, their uh, group of uh, people that they use for crowdsourcing. Things like Twitter for immediate updating and coaching, um, coming up with immediate answers or, or news. Um, and as we develop, we're going to use things that are more context sensitive. So, for example, my iPhone knows where I am. And if I type in, you know, Thai restaurants, it's going to tell me where the closest Thai restaurant is to where I am now. So we're going to get learning aids that are context sensitive. So this is an example of a museum in, at Cornell University. Um, and as you go through the museum with a smartphone, it knows where you are and it will beam information to your smartphone about the object. So we're going to see learning devices that are mobile, job aids that know where you are, know who you are, wearable kinds of devices that become a fashion statement that will superimpose various kinds of information on reality. Um, I think, you know, as we look at e-learning, this is, I think, a very important part of the palette. It, it is going to be the sort of augmented intelligence or augmented reality. Um, and solutions as apps. Um, young people think about buying apps, they don't think about courses. So they think about apps, either things that will help them do a job or to communicate with other people that they respect. And I think sort of the future for us is apps providers. Various kinds of business apps, collaboration, travel, personal development apps, these things are already out there. So I guess what I would end with is that we're not instructional designers anymore, and I don't think we practice instructional design. If we do that, that puts us in a box that I think is much too narrow. So I think we need to um, work on some of those principles, going back to Mager from 1960, uh, analyzing really what is, the, what is the, the cause of a performance problem and for us to become more of like a, I think a renaissance communicator person of being information architects uh, and really behavior engineers using the tools that are ubiquitous and that people use not just for learning but they use for life. Mm -hmm. I laid a lot on you. <laughs>
And I think we need to develop modalities that help us kind of classify where we are in terms of that concept. I think it's really important in terms of project management. Other questions or comments? Yeah. Throw one out there. Uh, early on in your presentation, you were talking about the prototyping when you had that, that design development model. Um, I've read some things about you know prototyping and having them, when you talk about interactive learning, having interactive prototypes and uh, doing that versus storyboarding, uh -huh. which, you know, the things I've read lends people to just think linear, linear, yeah. linear, and so many things that get developed are done with storyboards and storyboarding. Could you speak just for a minute to, to one versus the other, or what, what's your take on all of that? Yeah, I mean, I tend to you, I tend to go right into the simplest form of design that I can even if it is kind of ugly and clunky, and then only take it to higher levels of production if we need to, and then only build bigger shells around it if we really need to. So um, in many cases, I will use the simplest form of something that in a prototype, like maybe just start out with a wiki, or maybe just start out with something that's a very simple one-purpose app and see if that's good enough or if it needs to be enhanced in some way, either in terms of the production value or the scope of it. Um, I tend not to do things on paper because I do think it, it creates a very linear kind of mindset. And it's hard to, I find it hard to go back and forth between something that's linear and something that's in fact an interactive tool. Yeah. You said something about the abundance of data that's out there. I was thinking about this every every time I search Google. If I write a really good string, I've got to wade through mm -hmm. through results. That's happening. I've seen in some of my customers in there. For example, on their SharePoint sites, mm -hmm. where they've now put so much information out there, and there's no one in particular who is organizing it in a yeah. particular way. <laughs> What's going on now for better methods of organization? Of Great the question. I mean, I think that's where we have to collaborate with our colleagues in library science. So, for example. One of the things that we can do, we have vast online library resources through Ithaca. Um, and we work with our librarians to come up with really good search strings that are then saved. And then we can save that and ask for anything new that would come up with that search string to be sent to us. And it can be sent through email, now it can be sent to a portal. So I think what what we as instructional designers in collaboration with people in information science might do is come up with the right search strings and sources for people, have that fed in to some kind of push media, and then that does help filter the information. And it also pushes things out, like, boy, you should know this. Here's the latest article that came out that's exactly what you want. And that requires good, some good protocol for tagging or Absolutely. Something. Very good, yes, really good pro protocol for tagging. And, yeah. It strikes me with that question that if we're kind of working in a reality where we've got very quick production cycles, um, short shelf life of content, does part of the role then become, it seems like what we lack is we could use an army of people killing content that's no longer useful yes. or valid. Yeah. And that what a lot of organizations or groups collect are these very quickly produced, relevant for a short period of time things. And that's part of what people have to wade through, is, yeah. is the oldness that just lingers. And so it's part of the role of a old content pruning. destroyer. Yes. Yeah, pruning, that's a better, pruning. that's a more yeah, positive absolutely. term. Like that. Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at it as a garden, pruning. right? I mean, in some cases you need to plant stuff, in some cases you need to fertilize things, in other cases you need to prune things, and at a certain point you need to take stuff completely down, because it, you know, it's, it's no good and it's poisoning other things around it. But yeah, I mean, there are new roles, and, and again, if, if you think of yourself as an instructional designer, that doesn't fit anywhere into the adding model, you know? Yeah. Have you discovered any, like, prime numbers as far as, if, it's, if the audience is less than this, then you don't want to go here with that. Is there anything, you know, any kind of your experience as far as, like, if you, well, for instance, with ROI, if you're not spending more than a million dollars, don't even try to calculate return on investment. It's not worth your time and your effort. Is 
You know, I think it's it's a one on one case. I mean, I think there could be situations in which there are a couple of key players in an organization, and their job is so important that it would be worth it to, to do some very elaborate intervention. I mean, I've worked with organizations where there are certain levels of engineers in factories who are so, so critical to what goes on. There are not many of them, but they're very, very important. It would be worth it to invest a lot of money um, in whatever would improve their performance because it's so critical. So I'm not sure it's as much the end as it is the importance of what they, of what they do and the contribution of what they do. Um, and in other cases, like you might have a huge end, but you still want something <coughs> completely simple, like Twitter. So, yeah, I think that's one factor, but not the only one. <coughs> yeah. It didn't sound to me like you're completely dismissing the ag model, however. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the analysis to prototype sort of vehicle that mm -hmm. you had in the, in the 2.0, your analysis is obviously going to inform whatever performance objectives you will develop, which will then you know, determine the types of questions that you will develop, which then help choose the instructional strategy that you're going to use to, to, to push out those objectives. So, I mean, I heard you still talking about design tasks, and the prototype, of course, will be a, uh, a sort of, I don't know, like a cross section of those different instructional strategies of putting out to the audience. So are you necessarily saying that there is no design portion to that anymore? Because, I mean, do you lump that into analysis or? Because yeah. I mean, to me, it really sounded like you're still talking about analysis, design, development. It, it is, but it's, you know, I think it's sort of one thing that assumes all of those, I, I would call it engineering. And, and what, I, what I find hard is to know whether I'm designing or developing at a particular time because mm -hmm. Because if something is a prototype and I'm just playing with it, well, yeah, I have created it. It's not like it's just on paper and nobody can see it. Because it's out there, but it's kind of the design. And then the feedback that I'm getting on it is the analysis. So it's not necessarily something that happened first. It's happening continually, right? That's a function of a prototype, though. Like a develop, I mean, to me, but, development is, a prototype is part of development. But I think, you know, what I find now in some, in some cases, Things are always prototype. They never get beyond being a prototype. They, they're never done. Uh, if I look at like that financial analysis website, we hope that it was never done. We hope that there would be continuing new ideas, better job aids, new questions. You know, so it would never get to the point where it's not a prototype. It's always a prototype. And so part of what I look at is the balancing out how nice does it look with how easy is it for anybody to edit and how fast is it for anybody to edit. So I always try to keep things in the lowest level of complexity in terms of editing and changing it. So I think we do all those things and I think everything is designed. But I, I, don't, I don't necessarily aggregate those tasks as being separate or linear. Yeah. So Basically, what you're, th what you're proposing is that you kind of, instead of looking at a linear production, make it more organic. Mm -hmm. And just let it live and let it breathe and let it change and let it morph. So that way it becomes the correct vehicle for that certain um, objective or the, the measurable, whatever that is. Right. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. A, yes, a much more organic way and a much more participatory way as well. Because right. I think, you know, what, what I find often challenging is who is the master performer mm -hmm. or who is the subject matter expert. And in many cases, it's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And so you don't necessarily do that task analysis up front. You do some of that, but then some of that's informed by things that happen later once it's already out there. So yeah, it's more organic, it's more that you look at what do we really need to, what can we afford to do and what do we really need to get out there right now? And then let's build, you know, almost concentric circles around that until it's just polished enough. Yeah? In regard to content, uh, since good content is hard to find, <laughs> but we have attention deficit disorder, nobody reads anymore, nobody wants to read anymore, um, are you finding any patterns in Renaissance communication that affects how engaging content is written? To, is it more, should we be moving more toward a, the bulletized world and smaller bits of tweet pieces and Twitter pieces? Should we be thinking in terms of learning that way? In the
in some cases, I mean, I think in some cases it's just like a, a bulletin that goes out on Twitter, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't call that learning, I would call that maybe information. You know, we just found out this thing, you know, this just changed. But I guess I think that people always learn by stories and by mentoring. And the problem is if you learn very specific content, that changes. If you learn approaches to solving problems that's at a higher conceptual level, then it's more staying. So it's kind of like you need the stuff that changes in forms like Twitter or job aids. And then what I find with the ADD kind of thing, people do ask their trusted peers or mentors how to solve a problem. They don't have a problem listening to that. And by that, they learn the way that people think. So it's not necessarily the answer to something, but it's like, here's how we would approach the problem. And people seem to have quite a bit of persistence in doing that. And they also can triangulate. So they'll ask a number of different sources, how would you do this? And that's the way they learn. And so in some ways, we're not really producing as much content. We're producing networks. Yeah. to get managers' heads around the fact that things never really end. And so what you're doing is scoping something by saying that you're probably, um, instead of instructional designers creating a product that's done, they're more tending a number of sites, communities, applications, whatever you want to call it. And so it's not, I don't think it's really project management anymore as much as it is um, air traffic control. And, you know, I mean, the way that I look at it is your project is not to get these four planes off the ground because there, there are going to be four more after them, four more after them. You know, you just don't say, oh, I guess I, I, I went home, we got four planes in the air, I'm done. Um, but you might say I'm responsible for these three runways at in these times of the day. And I'm going to do all kinds of things. Some of them are taking off and some of them are landing and whatever. I'm responsible for everything that goes on in this corner of the world. Or if you look at it, you know, sort of tending gardens. You know, I'm responsible for these three gardens. And in some cases we're cleaning them up and other times I'm planting something, other times I'm <coughs> weeding something out, I, you know. So it, it's not really as much a project as it is maybe a scope of content or particular performers, and you're kind of managing all aspects of it, and the projects don't necessarily end. It's well, real straight. Yeah, yeah. It's a real different way of looking at it. Yeah. I have a follow-up question to that. Because you do own a business that goes into a client and consults on that, eventually you have to cut the court. Absolutely. How do you make that transition then? Because what you're proposing means training departments have to grow and grow and grow to continuously always be the owner of that content. If we're looking at the old model where training builds and deploys mm -hmm. and maintains, if we become the maintainer of everything, mm -hmm. we'll be the biggest department in the company. That's right. unlikely. Yeah, that's how do you do it as a consultant? Yeah. How, how do you start? I guess I, 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 not, I, I, I not only cut the cord, we never have the cord. So, <laughs> okay. um, so mm -hmm. I try to give them the idea, but then get them into doing it as much as possible right away. I kind of try to create the model and have them start playing in it and I sort of act as a coach. Teach so, them to build it for themselves. Yeah, so I usually don't build it. And, and it's interesting, I did that for very selfish personal reasons because through my career, I've been a full-time professor and I've done the consulting on the side and I'm, uh, I'm in centrally isolated but beautiful in the New York. So it also wasn't easy. I don't have any clients in my area. So the only way I could survive is to kind of give them an idea, but, but get them real involved. 
So um, again, it's a different kind of project project model. I think there's still business to be had there. And then the same thing goes for an internal training department. I think you, at a certain point, have to get it out to the performers themselves. So you build the tools. You know, you kind of come back and consult with them, but you're not develop. You're not building the content day to day. They are. Thank you. Yeah. In general, what type of tools do you use to develop your prototypes? The simplest, the the simpler the better. I mean, um, years ago I would use like the typical authoring tools, the easiest that I could, like Toolbook and Authorware, things that were easy and easy for the clients to change as well. And now that you have tools like, you know, wikis, um, blog tools. Is there something specific in the industry that's, that utilizes more than any other tools? For instance, we use Captivate uh -huh. a lot to develop training videos. Uh -huh. So is that something? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that can be a really good tool for particular kinds of things that fit within a larger scheme. You know, a lot of a lot of organizations will use a content management or a learning management system, and within that, there might be documents, there might be job aids, there might be videos, there might be simulations. You know, it's kind of a way to hang it. So you use Captivate for this and Microsoft Word for something else, right? PowerPoint for something else. But um, I've always tended to use the simplest and cheapest tools and the ones that my clients could get into the content and change. Unless, I mean, there are cases where things needed to be much more polished right. for a variety of reasons, and then, you know, then it gets some uh, programmers or videographers or whatever. Yeah. Do you find that when you've had this transition over to the client company, that the business begins to take ownership of their own line, as, as opposed to training department, come train my people, does it have that positive effect? I, I think so. Um, you know, and I would do things like on that one thing with financial analysis. You know, we we really had to do something right away. I mean, they were really screwing up majorly that they didn't understand how to do this. So I was literally saying, who can do this well? Can I talk to them on the phone? Can I record something? And then they did take a lot of ownership because that. And, and then I didn't want to make it sound too polished. And we did give the guys like, this is Terry Shaw, the Bandag rep in. Burlington, Vermont. And people knew, well, does that sound like a professional narrator? Well, no, it's Terry. But then Terry really had a lot of ownership. And Terry didn't want that up there once it wasn't right anymore, because that would be embarrassing to him. And then other people said, well, Terry got that up there. Well, hell, you know, I know about what. And then all of a sudden, we were getting calls from other people saying, oh, I got an Excel thing. I got this. Well, great, you know, come bring it on. Bring it on, guys. And, you know, because it wasn't challenging, because I could call Terry and I'd say, look, let's simulate a, a two-minute phone call with a client. Can I have, like, 15 minutes on Wednesday? Mm -hmm. It was no big deal. I wasn't asking him to, like, lay out this huge, incredible class. Yeah. And he actually, you know, he did have a lot of buy-in. And putting his name up there made all the difference in the world. And we really made it. And I think that's what you see in social media is that people's names are attached to it, so they it does become theirs. Thank you. I'm keeping people pretty late, so <laughs> I, I don't want to keep you in your seats because I'm, I'm sure people need to get home and do other things. I'm glad to stay and talk to individuals, but I want to kind of wrap it up so you don't feel like you're stuck here if you if, if you've had enough. So thank you again. This was fun. To <laughs>